Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Coffee with Craig, where we talk about all things firearms, firearms policy, politics, culture, media, you name it. We're talking about it right here on Coffee with Craig. So please take a moment, like, and share the program so that your friends can join in the conversation. Also, please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook. And in both cases, make sure you hit the notification button so that you can get the alerts as soon as we go live. And then you can participate in the live chat as the show is going on. Also, finally, please make sure to visit fpcgear.com. That's fpcgear.com. It's a very cool place to go and find all sorts of pro to a swag. T-shirts, coffee mugs, hoodies, stickers, you name it. You'll find it right there at fpcgear.com. The best part is every dollar that you spend goes right back into the fight for our right to keep and bear arms. So you can support the Second Amendment and you can look good doing it. It's fpcgear.com. All right, so yesterday we went over, we were talking about the hearing, the assault weapons ban hearing that took place in Washington, D.C. Now, I know some of you don't like me using the term assault weapons. I uh, Generally, I use the air quotes if I forget to use them. But I call it that because, well, that's what they, that's what, that's what they call the hearing. That's what it's called. If you go to Google it, that's what it will come up as. So that's what I call it. So I apologize if that offends any of you. Uh, let's just call it the gun ban hearing that they took that they had that took place in Washington D.C. on September 25th. Like I told you yesterday, there were a whole there's a whole lot of stuff in here to break down. So I broke it down into three videos. Yesterday you heard about the good. In other words, you heard about the testimony that took place that I think any reasonable and ob an objective person could li would listen to it and say, okay, I get what you're talking about. Then again, those who are trying to take our way our right to keep and bear arms, we know that they're neither reasonable nor are they objective. So, now we're going to talk about the bad. Because remember, we're talking about doing the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yesterday we did the good. Today's going to be the bad. So, now, this is the stuff that, quite frankly, helps us, helps us in a way in which it signals the direction that they're going to go, that they want us to go, whether it's the policymakers or the organizations that are advocating against our fundamental right to keep and bear arms. When we talk about the ugly, that's going to be tomorrow. That's going to be the ridiculous stuff that, you, I mean, just... The stuff that you will, will, will make you wonder, how can they even think that they should be taken seriously when they say stuff like this? That's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. But today, once again, it's going to be the bad. Today, we're going to talk about the bad. So, let's get right into it. All right, so, the first, first off is going, to be, uh, is going to be Congressman Nadler. Now, Congressman Nadler is the chairman of the committee. And what makes, uh, what makes in particular, some of the things that he says so bad is that um, there is absolutely no objectivity here. There is no, uh, at all, we're interested in hearing information as to how or what, you know, whether or not even this is something that makes sense. It's all about we're going to ban these things. And I think one can only listen, only has to listen to the language that they use and the terminology that they use to know that, uh, well, that's, that's their goal. Today's hearing is about whether America will tolerate weapons of war on our streets and in our neighborhoods. Simply put, civilian assault weapons are just semi-automatic versions of military weapons. They have no purpose but to kill as many people as possible as quickly as possible. So note, first of all, they start off with the term weapons of war. All right. So in other words, what they're trying to say is, is that anything, any firearm uh, that, that, is semi-automatic that's what he's trying to say here that any firearm that's semi-automatic well that's a weapon a weapon of war and there's no place on the streets now in this case they're talking about they're talking about long guns uh semi-automatic long guns they're calling them weapons of war uh tomorrow it'll be handguns that are semi-automatic and then eventually it'll be shotguns and then revolvers um and then knives once again they're going to be considering them weapons of war but this, once again this is the terminology that they're using uh because once again they're trying to basically they're trying to scare people they know this is on tv so they're trying to make sure people are scared to death the 1994 federal assault weapons ban which expired in 2004 was a watershed event that offers an important guide for our efforts today recent studies of the effect of the effectiveness of that law have shown that mass shooting fatalities were 70% less likely to occur compared to the periods before and after the ban. Another study found that the federal assault weapons ban was associated with a 25% drop in gun massacres and a 40% drop in fatalities. Okay, so 
let's lay this all out where he is just lying through his teeth. Okay, so first of all, there is no association. They have not. They never ever tied any association with of the the gun, that particular band with any of the things that he said. There is no association. Now, there were there were seventy percent less mass shootings during that time. But then again, the 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 number of mass shootings before the gun ban, before the the the, uh, the their ban, and after their ban. Now, keep in mind, we're still talking about the same firearms. The number of mass shootings before and after, no, they, 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 before and after, there weren't a bunch of mass shootings before then. Now there there have been there have been some after, but they but the issue is is that they they haven't been able to tie that one is correlated to the other. I'm sorry, not correlated, causative to the other. In other words, they're they're trying to say that uh, access to semi-automatic rifles caused the drop in mass shootings and that's just not the case the also the thing that they didn't note was that in a in particular in the last 12 years over 50 percent of the mass shootings have taken place or 50 percent involved handguns so that's why that is a lie and when they talk about gun deaths well guess what suicide rates went up during the assault weapons ban so there is once again there is no correlation or there is no causation and, and by the way when it comes to overall deaths there's no correlation so and and other studies have proven that yeah no they it had absolutely no effect it had absolutely no effect so needless to say the facts are not on his side uh, but once again that is not going to stop him from being able to say whatever it is that he is going to say now the next couple of videos but oh by the way the whole point of this is notice he doesn't note the studies because. He's trying to get hit in, get into an emotional thing. He wants to, he wants people who are watching this hearing to emotionally hate these firearms because then you don't need a logical reason to get rid of them because you hate them, and that's what the next couple of people who are testifying uh, are going to be doing. This is uh, this is Mayor Nan Whaley. She is the mayor of Dayton, Ohio, where there was a shooting, uh, and I just want you to note the rhetoric and note kind of the tone and the words that she uses when she's describing. Uh, by the way, she wasn't at the shooting, but as she arrived at the shooting, as she, this is her description of, of, of what happened. At 1.05 a.m., a young man armed with an AR-15 pistol variant walked down an alley between two bars and began spraying high-velocity rounds into the crowd. He then turned down a crowded street as people tried to run for safety. Friends pulled each other into doorways to try to escape falling bullets. One man threw his girlfriend to the ground and covered her body with his own. People literally ran out of their shoes. Less than a minute later, nine people were dead and 17 others had been shot. Dozens more were injured in the commotion. 32 seconds. In just 32 seconds, 26 people had been shot, nine families had lost loved ones, and dozens more will never be the same. The entire incident was over in half as much time as I've been speaking to you so far today. In those 32 seconds, the shooter's weapon did exactly what it was designed to do kill or injure as many people as possible in the shortest amount of time. It was a weapon designed to inflict maximum damage to human beings. It left a trail of destruction, not on some foreign battlefield, but down a historic brick street in Dayton, Ohio. Okay, so notice, once again, no data, no facts, specifically hit, and it, she, the way she would emphasize certain things during her testimony, once again, her whole, her whole goal is to hit people emotionally, not actually talk about the facts, right? Not talk about the facts that, for example, she talked about it spraying. Once again, they keep trying to tie semi-automatic firearms, or these firearms, to, uh, to fully automatic machine guns. That's what their attempt is to do, and they're trying to say, well, it's the same exact thing, but it's not the same thing, but it's the same exact thing. It's not the same thing, but it's the same exact thing. Yet, you and I know there is a there is a huge difference between the two, and uh, and and to claim that they are that they are both the same thing is just not accurate. Period. But once again, they don't care about accuracy; they care about emotion. So if you're going to talk about emotion, well, guess what else you need to do? You need to bring in a doctor. You need to bring in a doctor who's operated on individuals who've been shot. Why do you need to do that? 
because you need someone. You got to bring the blood and the guts, and that's what Doctor uh, Doctor Tovar brings to the table. I'm not a military surgeon, but what I saw looked like a war zone. Small gunshot wounds in the legs mounted to huge areas of cavitation and exit wounds larger than a grapefruit. i never seen anything like this before. How could a firearm create this type of destruction? All right. Once again, the whole goal of that was simply more, and he went on, he went on and on, but the whole goal of it was... To, was was to create emotion was to get people all oh my god i can't believe that this happened and and i i agree it's it's an it's an emotional thing i don't know that i i i, I never ever want to be in a situation where i have to experience anything like that but folks when you are talking about policy that is that is going to be implemented that is going to affect people's rights and people's safety then you need to be talking about the facts not worried about focusing on emotion and even people who they brought to the table who are supposed to be talking about facts, like uh, Miss Kristen Rand here from the Violence Research Center, and who's supposed to be talking about facts, also made it a point to do nothing more than demonize, demonize, demonize. Generally, semi-automatic assault weapons are civilian versions of military assault weapons. Semi-automatic assault weapons look the same as their military counterparts because they are virtually identical, save for one feature. Military assault weapons are machine guns capable of fully automatic fire. So what she noted was the one significant difference, or the a significant difference. She didn't get into caliber. She didn't get into some of the other differences. Uh, but the, the issue here, once again, is she's trying to say they're the same thing. Now... Mind you, that's the, the difference between an automatic weapon and a semi-automatic weapon is huge. But she wants to act like that's, well, that, that's just a small piddly thing. That's not really a big thing. And since, by the way, since we're just going to start off uh, demonizing, we're going to start demonizing the actual weapon, but let's start, start talking, let's go on, let's demonize the people who either want to purchase these or want to sell these. Assault weapons did not just happen. They were developed to meet well-defined combat needs. The most significant assault weapon functional design feature is the ability to accept a detachable ammunition magazine. The gun industry introduced semi-automatic versions of military assault weapons in order to create and exploit new civilian markets for these deadly weapons. The gun industry began to aggressively market assault weapons in the 1980s. And although the gun lobby today argues there's no such thing as a civilian assault weapon and now euphemistically refers to them as modern sporting rifles, the industry and gun magazines enthusiastically describe these civilian versions as assault rifles, assault pistols, and military assault weapons to boost civilian sales throughout the 1980s. All right, so... You see, you see where she's going here. These, these aggressively marketing and these, you know, euphemistically call them uh, sp sp uh, sport right hunting sport sporting right modern sporting rifles. All of this is to say that the people who want these are evil. The people who manufactured these are evil. These things are evil, right? Because you mark. Therefore, they are evil. Because they are evil, you need to ban them. So now they've set the table. Those of us who believe in our right to keep and bear arms and believe it applies to our right to be able to own and possess any firearm that is safe and in common use, those of us who believed that ruling, well, we're evil. We are evil. They are not. They are good. And because they are good, clearly what they want to do must be good. And that leads us to this guy. This is Mr. David Chipman. Uh, he uh, was worked for the ATF, I believe he says something like 25 years uh, working for the ATF. Well, now he works for the Gifford Law Center. Uh, so he was a, a gun grabber when he was working with the ATF, and now he is a gun grabber uh, working for the Giffords Law Center. And uh, I, I think that, that, first of all, the first statement that was made, the one you heard by Mrs. Rand, gives you one idea about where it is that they want to go. Uh, one idea that they have is, is, that they is, is high-capacity magazines. They want, or I'm sorry, I Forgive me, 
standard capacity magazines. They want to go after standard capacity magazines that hold more than 10 rounds. That is one thing that we all know this. Uh, it's happened in multiple areas already. And this is the thing that they want to see at the federal level. They want to see getting rid of the ability to be able to, to own and possess those magazines. Uh, here's something. Let, let's just check out the first part of Mr. Nadler's, not Mr. Nadler, Mr. Shipman's comments. And it'll give you an idea of exactly uh, some of the things that he wants to do. Uh, during the uh, 1994 ban, uh, people got around the ban by uh, various means. How should we define a, uh, an assault rifle that, that we might want to ban uh, in order to get around the, the easy adaptability of such weapons uh, by putting on various parts or some other way? Uh, thank you for your question, Chairman Matt Nadler. I think the major problem with the 94 law is that it defined an assault rifle, for example, by the ability to take a detachable ammunition magazine, which is the most important, most deadly feature, and then require two additional listed assault rifle features, such as a pistol grip on, or a bayonet lug. And basically what the industry did was take off one of the more superfluous um, factors like a bayonet lug, but they could retain the pistol grip, which allows the shooter to have better control during rapid fire. So if we go to what's known as a one characteristics test um, and clearly define those characteristics that define an assault weapon, and assault weapons also include assault pistols and assault shotguns, then we'll be on much firmer footing. All right, so I jumped a little bit of a, I jumped a little bit ahead in my whole commentary right there, but you can see. So the first thing that she wants to do is she wants to uh, redefine in this what is an assault weapon and get rid of what basically what's called the idea of featureless. That's the first thing that that she wants to do. So she wants a very very strict definition as to what uh, what these is to what these rifles are. Uh, she also goes on to then talk about standard capacity magazines. I think also if you look at the marketing of these weapons, they're, they're sold using militarized imagery, and now we're seeing assailants who copy that. They come with body armor. Yeah, so now she wants to go after body armor. And that's, once again, it doesn't stop with the firearm. It goes with the firearm. Then they want to go after the magazines. Now they want to go after the marketing, how you market these particular products. So in other words, they want to tell you what you can't, they want to go after your free speech rights, what you can and you can't say. In particular, in this case, how you market a, how you market a, a, a constitutional right. I mean, you, you already see that the, the, they don't believe that if you, they don't believe that basically what they're saying is, what she is saying is, you don't have a right to free speech if you are promoting the Second Amendment. So the First Amendment doesn't apply to you if, you're, if you are promoting the Second Amendment. And then because of that, then she wants to go after things like, well, body armor. So in other words, when someone comes to try and, well, take your life, you shouldn't be able to have access to things that will allow you to be able to defend yourself, not just a firearm, but also body armor. Okay, now that gets us on to Mr. Chipman. Uh, Mr. Chipman, uh, well, let, let's just give you a, an idea of where Mr. Chipman's coming from. Do you think state laws are sufficient given that as in Gilroy, the shooter can just cross a state line and get something banned in his own state? Um, we need a national um, comprehensive approach. I, I was just out in Denver and uh, we're talking to people there focused on the issue of gun violence. Half of their crime guns come from other states. Um, many of the crime guns in Chicago that we heard uh, talked about earlier are coming from states like Indiana. And that's from firearms trafficking. If we had comprehensive and universal laws and approaches to regulation at the national level, there would not be this interstate travel to go and work around the law. It's really no different than when we had different drinking age. Kids would go to another state to get by underage. All right, so there's a couple of things. Um, so what he's talking about now is he's talking about creating a national. He's talking about why we need national legislation. But here's the thing I don't understand. If, if, quote, unquote, easy access to firearms promotes gun violence, then why aren't states like Indiana and Texas and Arizona the most violent states in the country? Why, are, why is there not massive gang violence and suicides in these particular states? Why is it that for some reason 
that violence then seems to manifest in places like Chicago or Los Angeles or New York. See, here's the reason why. Because it's not the guns. It's the people. Why is it that the people in Chicago are feeling a need to go to Indiana, break the law to obtain a firearm, come back to Chicago, and, in, and, and commit crimes? Or have someone go there? I, mean, I don't know if you guys are getting what I'm seeing here. What I'm saying here. In other words, if that's the case, why isn't Indiana, why doesn't Indiana have 1,500 gun deaths in one year? Why not? I mean, if access to firearms is what causes, you know, gun violence, then that's because that's not the case. That is just simply not the case. But once again, that, that sort of policy, that sort of logic, that sort of reasoning doesn't make sense. Um, and needless to say, once again, as we're going to continue to blame access to the firearms, well, we need to also make sure that we blame the evil gun industry. And that's what my good friend, uh, uh, my other good friend over here, uh, decided that he wants to do. Now, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act was passed uh, in 2005, the year after... Congress allowed the assault weapons ban to expire. And the Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act prohibits people from filing wrongful death lawsuits against gun manufacturers and gun dealers. When the families of the Sandy Hook victims took Remington Outdoor Company to court for mass marketing assault weapons to civilians, specifically for mass shootings, it took the case five years just to overcome a challenge under the PLCAA, and that was one of the success stories. Uh, what we don't see are all of the assault weapons cases that are not brought into civil court because of uh, PLACA. Now, Mr. Chipman, uh, how does the existence of the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act prevent victims and their families from seeking justice? It blocks them from holding an industry accountable before a court of law like every other business in America is held accountable. Right. So like every other business. So just so you guys know, so what the, uh, what, what the, the act that the individual is talking about here is, is basically it protects gun companies from being sued for doing, for basically selling a legal product marketing and selling a legal legally selling and legally marketing a product that is legal for sale for being sued if someone misuses or uses that intentionally uses that thing in a crime now mind you these are not this these are in other words these are not defective firearms right so someone buys a firearm and they go out and they commit a crime with it they want to sue the individual who sold it to them and they want to sell sue the individual who manufactured it that's like saying if someone Drink, if someone drinks and drives, we need to sue the car company. We need to sue, need to sue the guy who sold the guy the car. So it, it, this is not something that you can do to every other company. And that, once again, that goes back to the deceptiveness uh, and the, the flat out, quite frankly, flat out lies that individuals like Mr. Chipman uh, tell. And the way they talk about how they manufacture them specifically I mean, I mentioned they market them specifically to promote mass shootings. And that is just BS. And you and I know that's BS. When given examples, they, can, they couldn't point to, they could not point to an example of, okay, what exactly do you mean by specifically marketing to mass shootings? Give me an example of that marketing. Why? Because they absolutely positively cannot. Because that's not how they were marketed, right? But all of that having been said, all, what these guys are basically saying is they just want to go after, they want to sue gun manufacturers. And what their goal is, is, is they, if they cannot ban guns, they want to make it so no one can afford to manufacture them by constantly tying them up in court, right? Now, I, you know, some people are thinking, well, but if, you know, well, they'll have lawyers and we'll, and our guys will have lawyers. Yep, the, part of the challenge is they have billionaire. They have a billionaire who is literally putting all sorts of money into their legal actions and to their political actions. I mean, literally, we would be fighting billionaires, right? People who, who are using the interest from their billions 
to fight us, <laughs> let alone, you know, the resources. And what will happen is a lot of companies, in particular a lot of smaller manufacturers, will just wind up having to go out of business. And that's what their goal is. Their goal is to put them out of business so that, well, hey, yes, you have a right to own one, but, uh, well, hey, we're not worried about whether or not you have, you know, you may have a right to own one, but uh, if no, you don't have a right to manufacture one. And that's what their goal is, to make sure you can't have access to one. All right, now this, uh, this little piece right here will give you a, a better understanding of exactly where Mr. Chipman wants to go. <coughs> uh, but it's based on my experience that a law, uh, the NFA, was meant to keep the most dangerous weapons out of criminal hands, and it's working. Only three out of every thousand crime guns traced by ATF is a machine gun. So laws work. And so if we want to focus on other types of weapons, I would suggest we have a time-tested law that's been on our books since the 1930s. Let's take that approach. And that, what is your position on the buyback programs? Um, <clears throat> I think that um, we should be looking to America, not Australia, for solutions. And as I said, the NFA was passed at a time where we had a similar problem. Right. Very lethal weapons. And so I would suggest that it's a balance that would honor um, the rights of people who have these guns to keep them if they were properly regulated and understood that there's so many of them out there that, like machine guns, you know, it would prevent them from being manufactured and sold in the future. Once again, we'll protect the rights of the people who own them but we're going to make sure they're not manufactured and sold in the future. Basically meaning the rest of you have no rights. You do not have a right to own or possess a firearm that's safe and in common use. Um, and that's using the NFA, which basically, for those of you who know, is the National Firearms Act, which is a both a tax and a paperwork nightmare. It makes it so it's almost impossible for you to obtain certain items uh, like uh, suppressors or... Uh, short barrel shotguns, or various other items that are, are, are regulated by the NFA. But their whole goal here would be to basically make, regulate them out of existence. So in other words, yeah, you have a right to own one. Uh, here's a million hoops you have to jump through, and you may or may not ever actually get uh, to exercise that right. And by the way, once it's regulated by the NFA, then you're going to have certain other states that are still going to, once again, ban them. Because they're going to be like, well, look, hey, obviously it's a dangerous item. Obviously it's, it's, not, uh, it's not usual because it's now regulated under the NFA. For, let's forget the fact that there are tens of millions of these firearms that are already, once again, safe and in common use. Right? But that's the thing that Mr. Chipman has been pushing is this whole idea of regulating them under the NFA. So, And, and it sounds like a moderating thing. But in essence, it's a tax and a ban. It's a tax on a civil right. And I'm telling you right now, folks, it sounds like a moderation, but it's not. It is, de it is anything but because the people who regulate these things are going to, first of all, they're going to be told, yeah, no, you're going to not give any permits. In other words, no one is going to be able to, to own or purchase these items uh, once they're regulated under the NFA. You know, your stuff will be... They will make the process so restrictive that, yeah, no, there's absolutely no way you'll pos probably be able to get under there. But now they wanted to ask him, and this was, a, and this was an interesting question that was asked, and I think it, it also underscores a very uh, significant other misconception about firearms today. Uh, why do you believe it's important that we have a conversation now about assault weapons and what about your experiences have led you to believe that we need reform? Because they're getting more lethal, and we should have had this conversation decades ago. Um, the firearms industry um, continues to make more lethal firearms, and Congress is not keeping up with technology. Um, we see that in now um, smaller weaponry, uh, like my panel member likes to have, because it's easy to carry around in her car. Uh, but it was used to kill uh, a Milwaukee police officer because it was able to defeat his bulletproof vest. So to me, um, we should not uh, tip the scales on the side of just convenience, but of our right to live in a country absent the fear of getting shot and killed. All right. So in other words, what he's saying is he, see, he called it convenience. He didn't call it rights. He didn't call it liberty. He called it convenience because, see, to him... Owning and possessing firearms, the right to keep and bear arms, it's, it's a luxury. It's a luxury that he, 
because, well, he wore a badge. Um, it's a luxury that he gets a right to determine whether or not you have and how you get to exercise it because he is so much better than you. He is so much better than us. And, uh, and, and, and that's the, the, in the end, and, and he's saying they're getting more lethal now. I, I don't know. Maybe all of the things that, and it's interesting though, the things that they're talking about are all, once again, cosmetic features of a firearm. But the basic function of an AR or an AK has pretty much remained the same since they were invented. Nothing's changed. These firearms are not more lethal. You know what's more lethal? The individuals who are using them. The individuals who have chosen to use them. And that means it's a people issue. But see, he doesn't want to deal with the people because, well, guess what? He's failed at that so far. So because he's failed at that, now he wants to go after your firearms. He wants to go after the tools. But what he fails to realize is, well, yeah, once you go after the tools, they're going to find something else. They're going to use something else. Or, as we all know, banning something in these United States is totally effective at making sure people don't get access to it, right? Yeah, no. Anyway, folks, that's going to be it for today's Coffee with Craig. You guys have seen the bad. Tomorrow, we will be talking about the ugly. And trust me, you guys do not want to miss this. It is going to have you both... Uh, shockingly upset and angry, as well as laughing, uh, rolling in your seats. Anyway, once again, that's going to be it for today's Coffee with Craig. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for liking and sharing the program, telling your friends about the Firearms Policy Coalition. We are the home in the fight for civil rights. Got to use them or you're going to lose them. You guys take care. If you like our videos, follow, subscribe, like, and share.